She's a blue jean baby with her hat down low Chasing that wild wind wherever it blows Flying through the night just as fast as she can go Dina Kirkpatrick. I'm Amberly. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thanks for letting us come. Let you show us how you make it in a day of oh, a rodeo cowgirl. Absolutely. When did you start roping calves? So I roped a little bit when I was younger. Um, my family is not a rodeo family, so to do anything that I wanted to do was kind of figuring out myself. So I started really roping seriously when I was in eighth grade. That's when I got my first breakaway horse, that he was all mine, you know, I didn't borrow him or anything, and it was kind of crazy. Our very first rodeo was actually junior high state finals, and we won the breakaway to go to oh. nationals. So it so, was kind of cool, but. Oh, so you're raising are, yourself some practice Yeah, cabbies. these are my little Holstein babies. Oh, don't name them, it'll be hard to. Oh, you just break away though. I just That's break away them. Yeah. Oh, and my little sister's already named them, don't worry. Oh. <laughs> we have Peanut and Taz right here. Aww. But yeah, these are just two of my little bottle calves. They haven't done a whole lot yet. Yeah, and Holsteins do good for not getting going too fast. That's the whole deal. I'm, mm -hmm. All I need is solid practice. Right. Like, I don't need anything to be screaming up and right. down the practice Plus pen it, with. And it's easier on your horse. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, yeah, since my horse is kind of old, he doesn't need it either. He thinks practice is silly as it is, <laughs> so. He just wants to go to the show. He really just wants to rodeo. <laughs> that horse, oh, it rope in the dummy. He'll do funny things every single time. Act like he's gonna buck, anything like that. But you get in the corner to rodeo and this horse, he means business of what he's doing. So cool. So, but, so I'll show you where we'll rope at. We're okay. actually just getting it set up. We'll have to go. So when you were younger, did you go to I'll a squeeze through here? I mean, you know, I'm gonna squeeze around you. Sorry, Nash. I'm gonna go this way. Say that again? I said, when you were younger, went to rope, did you go to a friend's house? Because I said, it's one thing to stick three barrels out in a, out in a piece of dirt. You can do it anywhere. You can do that anywhere, but you can't go roping anywhere. So actually, kind of, I really didn't get a rope that much. Um, honestly, I wish I'd be able to do it more. The very first summer I started roping, my dad got me calves. Now, granted, nobody at my house knows how to take care of calves. <laughs> so I'm trying to bottle feed these little jerseys. They all lived. They oh, did all live. That's awesome. but. I got them way too fat, so yeah. <laughs> they couldn't, we're just, so this is my, I oh, mean, yeah. heck, if we even want to show this, we're just going to set this up now that I have help here, because yeah. I haven't been able to rope out of here in a couple of years. Um, right. I've been up at school, right? so I'm finally back home, which is why this is still kind of a little weed patch, but yeah, as my fat jerseys didn't fit in my little shoot yeah. right there, so <laughs> that ended my, uh, my practice. Anyway, these are these are my two barrel horses out here. Well, one looks like he's dead, but he's just sleeping. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but this is my horsepower, and that's Legacy over there. I we just built this pen actually, um, like a week ago, because mine they used to be down in the other pens. Oh, down um, on the other side of that. Yep, on the other side down spot, there. The road there. Is there the a road rest, there? Uh, yeah, yeah, little asphalt road like this the whole way down. But man, it was tiring. Like. If I wanted to go ride and catch my own horses, by the time I wheeled down there, wheeled out, caught horses and wheeled back up, I was too tired to do anything else. This is the road that we would go up in order to uh, get up to the trailer so I could saddle. Which you think, I mean, it's not like it's that bad because it's all paved and whatnot. By the time I'd get to the top up here, I thought, I don't even know if I want to ride anymore yeah. today. <laughs> so this year I decided if I was coming home, my horses, at least my barrel horses, were gonna be right here where I could catch them by myself and not be exhausted to saddle and get on. Yeah. So yeah, my two barrel horses get to be right here and everything else is down there. We do this all in a wheelie. This is oh. all wheelie life. Yeah. Like, 
people, I, I get made fun of all the time saying I'm showing off and I say, no, this is really how you have to be all the time if you don't want to get flipped out. That's what I'm saying, you like, don't want to be not, a yard dog. It's, it's honestly, it's like survival. It's <laughs> not anything else. So, uh, well, we could, go down, we could go down and check out these other horses actually. I'll show you my little sorrel that I had, but yeah, this is all wheelie life because I have tried to do this on four wheels and I end up sitting on the ground. So there's rocks and everything. Uh-huh. And they'll catch my front wheels off, uh -huh. off anything. But yeah, they used to live down here, which is why that didn't really work out as well. And they're pretty good in my chair about not running away. Like this power is, he's really aware of it. Like he'll, I mean, he does pretty good coming up to the gate for me, but my rope horse and definitely my bay horse legacy, he'll, I think they think it's funny just to stay out of reach. Mm -hmm. And so by the time, if I had to chase them anywhere out so here. So you catch them by yourself? Yes. In your chair, wow. I would, some like sometimes, if I have help, I use it. Like right. I love to sure, have sure, my sure. help oh, out yeah, there. Yeah. But, but if you were totally alone, oh, you yeah. can't catch them. Yeah, which is why you now I yell at my... them a lot when you're doing that. I try to do it nicely. <laughs> <laughs> I try. I've learned patience. Uh, one of the top ten things I have learned in this situation is patience. Mm. Patience and appreciation. Because after my wreck, like when I'd have to sit there and somebody else would have to saddle my horse, it used to make me mad. Like I could feel myself being so mad at that person, which is not their fault. Mm. But it's just, I mean, heck. My very first horse was a pony at three years old. And the reason I wanted a pony was so I could saddle it by, by myself. By yourself. I didn't want a horse because I couldn't get up there and saddle it by myself. So since I've started this, I've always done it independently. So at the very beginning when I had to watch somebody else catch my horse and saddle my horse and everything, and I just had to sit there, it, it would make me mad. And I've had to learn how to appreciate that. You know, they're, they're helping me because they want to see me right. succeed and they're helping yeah. me do what I want to do. And yeah, it's been good to learn that really. That and patience. Makes you a better person even though it's been a hard row. Oh, absolutely, without a doubt. I mean, I definitely wouldn't be the person I am without this whole situation. knew I wanted a big family so in fact I wanted six kids and so that's what we have we have four daughters and two sons and Amberly is the second oldest and um, Amberly actually my two oldest daughters Ashley and Amberly were actually in the room when my youngest daughter Autumn was born so uh, Amberly watched her baby sister be born and, and those two still have quite the bond. I always had the horse love growing up and I did have a horse. Um, I always wanted to be a bell racer, but my parents, I was lucky enough to just have a horse. We didn't have a tracker trailer and I couldn't do any, go anywhere with it. So I had barrels set up at the house and I just would ride my horse around the barrels. So when Amberly showed an interest in horses at a very young age, then I definitely wanted her to be able to do what I wasn't able to do. And I don't know if she wants this story in there, but it was every time I changed her diaper on the top of the Baby Fresh Wipies, there's animals on the lid and there's one horse on there. And so every time I'd change her diaper, she would point to that horse and say, me ride, mommy. And she was like literally a year and a half old. And there's other animals on there, so there's like a, a an elephant and a duck and I would point to those and just joke around and you know say are you gonna ride this and there's one horse and she'd say no me ride mommy and that's that's when it started so when I saw that I just thought okay I'm taking it from here like I wanted her to do what I couldn't do so shortly after that I started showing her the barrel pattern and when she could hold a pencil I would draw three circles on paper and take her hand and do the pattern on paper or I would do it on her hand and I would just go over and over the barrel pattern because I wanted her to be able to do what I didn't get to do. 
We were living in California at the time, and actually, because Corey was playing ball, I mean, we were pretty engrossed in baseball and followed him everywhere around the country. And so, no, we didn't, we weren't involved in rodeo at all, but I just, like I would read horse books to her or buy her little horses and I just wanted her to, to keep that desire. By the time she was three, she was bugging me so much every day, telling me she wanted to ride, that we, we had to go find a place that would even let a three-year-old ride. So we did find a place in San Juan Capistrano in California and with some coaxing, the lady there said she would take a three-year-old. She kept telling us she was too young, but she said she would take her and I mean, then it was just game on. That's all she wanted to do. And when she was adamant, like she was gonna ride. No, my oldest daughter was a gymnast her whole life and by the time she was five years old, she was training five hours a day, five days a week. And then Amberly went into the horses. Um, of course, the boys played baseball. And Autumn was with me, all, and me and Amberly at the rodeos all the time. She, you know, I had her in tow. So when she was about four, she told me that that's what she wanted to do. So I was excited I had another one. Amberly, was always so driven and so organized, really, that she really, she would find all the rodeos, tell me when entries were due, um, mom, you need to you know, go take this paper here, or pay for this there, or mail this in by this day. Like She was on top of it. So I was actually pretty lucky that a lot of times, I mean, I knew I had to get in the truck on the weekends, but she told me what direction we were going and what rodeo we were hitting. I would say that started from probably 10 years old on. Um, Amberly's eighth grade year was the first year of National Junior High. That's for sure they had nationals. And so she told me we were heading to this rodeo and we thought we were only going to take a horse, a rope horse for her to try. So she didn't even bring her barrel horse. She just went to this rodeo to try this horse. And so, first time roping on this horse, barely has started roping. Well, she wins the whole rodeo and wins the breakaway roping. So they go to hand us, you know, at the end. They said, congratulations, you're going to gallop. And me and Amberly looked at each other I'm like, Amberly, what, what are we doing, you know? And they're like, you're going to New Mexico. And the whole way home, we didn't know how we were going to tell her dad. Like, we were scared. We're, she's like, I'm not telling him. You tell him. I'm not, I'm not telling him. You're going to tell him we've got to go to New Mexico, you know? We were at the tryouts for the, we were at the state finals to see who was going to nationals. And Amberly won it. She didn't even bring her barrel horse, so she was so bummed because she's like, I could have, you know, done something in barrels or poles or whatever, and she just brought that breakaway horse to try him out and wins the whole thing. So that was our first national rodeo. to do her FFA um, convention week the week before. So she was in Logan, and she was gonna leave from Logan and, and go to Denver. And she called me as she was heading out on Saturday night. She had just finished convention, and I, I was a little nervous. I didn't really want her to drive from Logan to Denver in the dark, you know, on roads she hadn't been on by herself, but she was adamant she was going to do that. And then actually she got pulled over by a cop and he told her if she went back to Logan and started in the morning, he wouldn't give her a ticket. So she called me and said, well, you should be happy, mom. I'm going to drive tomorrow in the daylight. So I kept in contact with her and I just thought, well, maybe she's in a canyon and, you know, she'll get back to me in a bit. And it was about 10 minutes after that that 
that I got the phone call that she'd been in an accident. When my phone rang and I looked at it and it said Amberly on my phone, So to answer the phone, and Amberly was calling me from Life Flight and telling me that she was being Life Flighted to Casper and that I needed to go there. And actually the first thing Amberly said to me was, she said, Mom, you're going to be so mad at me. I didn't have my seatbelt on. And I just said, Amberly, you're talking to me. That's all that matters. And so then, you know, I talked to her then, and then the second thing would be that I came across her truck uh, on, on the drive. And so after seeing her truck and knowing I still wasn't going to get to her for two hours after that, um, and not knowing what shape she was going to be in after seeing that truck, that was really hard. Right off, you know, when they told her she would never walk again, and I. I promised her she would. I, I told them, don't listen to what they're telling you. And, you know, I'm your mom and I promise you're going to walk again. And she would say, well, you can't tell me that, mom. You know, don't you hear what they're saying? I said, I don't care what they're saying. I'm promising you're going to walk again. And so we just, like, we literally blocked out what anyone would tell us. And we just held on to that. And even after they would leave the room, you know, I'd just look at her and say, no, don't, don't listen to that. Don't let that sink in. That's not how it's going to be. And, and at one point, you know, when they told her that she would never ride again, and she was laying in bed, and she looked at me, and she just said, promise me, Mom, that I'll ride. And I said, Amberly, if I have to strap you on, you will ride again. I don't care what they say. You will ride again. So it was just, we just kind of did that back and forth in the hospital, that no matter what they told her, we were, we were not going to listen to it. And there were definitely hard times. I mean, we, we would allow ourselves, we would lock the nurses out, we'd shut the door, you know, and we'd give ourselves like 20 minutes and cry and that, and then we'd say, okay, now, we're not going to stay here. This is, we're going to go up from here. And so we did that a lot. It wasn't always easy. Even to the point where they told her she couldn't drive a truck anymore, and we went back into the room, and she looks at me, and she says, Mom, we're truck people. And I'm like, and we're staying truck people. I don't care. They, you're not going to drive a car. <laughs> you know, you're going to drive a truck. So we just, we didn't listen to what they said. I think one of the most important things I've learned is value of life, really, and how quickly it can change. You can't take anything for granted because it, it can all change in the blink of an eye. Right before I left to Denver, um, I had brought in all my saddles, all my bridles, all my tack to clean it. So I went up in my room and I had sprawled it all out, cleaned it all, and then I thought I was just gonna leave it hanging out there till I got home from Denver, which is when I got in my wreck. And I told my parents, don't touch my tack. Like I want to, I want to do it when I get home. Well, that very first time I wheeled back in my room, they don't warn you about that. They don't warn you about the very first time you wheel back into your room, you know, you really, it like hit you that you were walking. So I wheel into my room and I see everything. I mean, scattered across my floor. And I mean, I felt like I was looking at the pieces of my life that honestly, I couldn't even pick up by myself. And so I'm sitting there and as I'm sitting by, uh, by my bed, I just had the feeling to look behind me and my scriptures were by my bed. And I had the feeling to open them up and I opened it up. And right before I left, I had not only bookmarked, but it highlighted with God, nothing is impossible. And I like read that and thought, okay, I'm gonna, like, I can handle this. I'm gonna be able to do this. And I don't know, I've had really awesome moments like that along yeah. the whole way that have just reminded me that honestly, 
Like with God, nothing's impossible, and I really can do this. And you are really proving it. I hope so, <laughs> man, I hope so. We all say that, and we all have it on a poster in our houses. Right. But we all, those of us who haven't had to face this kind of a hardship, haven't actually been proving it. I said that horse was fast, and I'm going to prove it to you. How about 15?